so much for taking the time to join us today. My name is Jenna and I'm with Emerging Destinations. We represent cool companies in cool places. And today I'm being joined by Judy Carvajal, who is the owner and founder of Enchanted Expeditions um, in Ecuador. So before we hear from Judy and before I introduce our subject for the day, I am going to go over a couple quick uh, housekeeping notes, but even before that, I'm gonna introduce our portfolio to you. So. Of course, we have a, um, a lot of different accounts, as you can see up there on your screen. But since we're talking about Enchanted Expeditions today, which is in Ecuador and South America, I'm going to introduce our Americas portfolio to you. So to kick that off, we have Canyon Madness Ranch, who are located in New Mexico, uh, Grand Hotels Lux, and they have properties in Uruguay and Argentina, Las Chores Patagonia, who are located in Cerro del Paine National Park in Chile, uh, Travel Pioneers, who is a DMC and uh, located in Costa Rica, but also covering a lot of Central America, and then Colombian Journeys, who is a DMC in Colombia, and last but not least, Chile Concept, who is a DMC in Chile. So, of course, if you have any questions about any of the um, the companies that you see up on your screen there, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email address is on the bottom of your screen, so uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions or inquiries, if you'd like some digital materials, and I'm also always more than happy to uh, schedule a private training for you and your team to give you more information on any of the accounts that you see up there. So, of course, we also have our Europe and our African portfolio, so again, any questions on any of those, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, a couple other hosts Keeping items to go over this webinar will be recorded so if you do need to step away or if you have to answer a call whatever it may be please don't worry we will be sending the recording out to everyone hopefully tomorrow I hope to get it out to everyone bye um, also keep in mind that all of our previously recorded webinars are available on our emerging destinations YouTube channel and our emerging destinations website as well so if there is any that you've missed in the past feel free to go and get caught up there and then we will also be doing a Q&A with Judy at the end of this webinar. So if you do have any questions that arise um, throughout her presentation, uh, please feel free to type those through using the GoToWebinar control panel located on the right-hand side of your screen. If you type through any comments or questions, we will get to those at the end um, of the webinar. Of course, time permitting, we'll, we'll try to get to as many as possible, but if there are any questions that we don't answer during that time, please uh, be aware that we will send you out the answers to those questions in the webinar follow-up as well. So um, without further ado, I'm going to pass things over to Judy, who's going to be talking about um, the Galapagos and mainland Ecuador today. So I know we've done previously, we've talked about the Galapagos and then we've talked about mainland Ecuador, but Judy's going to talk to you a bit more about why you should combine the two. So why you should send your clients to mainland Ecuador after or before doing a, a Galapagos cruise or a Galapagos tour. Um, and I won't uh, share any of the secrets that she will um, surely be telling you, but I will pass things on to her now. So I really hope you enjoy um, our webinar. My name is Judy Carvajal. Uh, Jen has already introduced you. And today, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Jenna and I would like to thank Emerging Destinations for giving me this opportunity to talk about Ecuador and Galapagos and what makes it so special. But before I actually start the presentation, I want to mention something, because oftentimes when we think of traveling to Galapagos, we know little about the richness of the rest of Ecuador. People have Galapagos on their bucket list, but often overlook the mainland. The purpose today is to give you an idea of what an ideal trip to Ecuador should look like either starting off on mainland Ecuador and then ending in the Galapagos or vice versa, even though we tend to recommend Galapagos last because it is, you know, such a highlight. However, skipping the mainland would be forfeiting an experience that stands on its own here on this continent. So I have designed this presentation as a visual trip to all four regions of Ecuador. I will be starting with a brief description of the country as a whole, then proceed to this visual tour. Hopefully this will help inspire you and your clients to spend some time on the mainland. So here we go. Yes. Anyway, our story as enchanted expeditions. 
Um, we've been, we're a DMC uh, for Ecuador and Galapagos. We've been doing this for a very long time. We're the owners of two boats in Galapagos, the Beluga and the Cachalote Explorer, and a lodge on Santa Cruz Island called uh, Enchanted Galapagos Lodge. That's a fairly new acquisition. We are a family business. Um, we have been operating a DMC on mainland Ecuador for over 30 years and 40 years plus here in the Galapagos. Uh, many of us were actually guides before we got into the business. And uh, of course, we love nature and yeah, that's our passion and the culture. Ecuador, in case you don't know, is actually quite a small country. It's no point giving you numbers. If you look on the map here of South America, you see the size of it. And it's on the equator. It's about the size of Colorado. Um, and more specifically, oops, sorry about that. Yes, anyway. And what does Ecuador have that's so special? We have four distinct regions. We have the Galapagos Islands out in the Pacific. We have the Andes, the Andean Highlands, which run north to south through the country. And we have the Amazon area on the east, and of course, the Pacific coast. This, because of the size of the country and such diverse areas uh, in all these four regions, it is considered the most compact mega diverse country in the world. We have over, well, pretty well close to 2000 bird species, 18 species of the world species in birds, 15% endemic, 19% of the areas of the land is, is protected. 3000 species of orchids, 60% of all species identified in South America. 17 different indigenous nationalities, four world heritage sites, two natural and two cities, over 150 festivals, 32 volcanoes, over 4,000 meters. Chimborazo considered closest to the point, closest to the sun because you know we're on the equator. So general information, I already told you about the size of the country. The languages spoken here are the official language is Spanish and a fair number of the population, the indigenous population speak Quechua. The currency is the US dollar, population 17 million, and the ethnic groups would be mestizo, indigenous, Afro-Ecuadorian and European. And as I said, for UNESCO sites. Uh, this is an image of the country. Um, as you can see, here is where they would be considered the uh, Andean highlands. This is the Amazon basin here, and this is the coastal area, and of course, Galapagos out there. So we start by flying to Galapagos, which is roughly, if you flew directly from Quito, would be an hour and a half. But however, the flights often stop in, in Guayaquil to pick up passengers. And then it's, it's about two hours altogether. So we leave from Quito, we arrive in Galapagos, the famous Galapagos Islands. And these islands are 600 miles west of Ecuador. They lie, it lie, they lie on the equator. They are 14 major islands, as you can see. It's one of the birthplaces of nature-based tourism. Of course, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. 97% of the land is a national park. On, on the other 3%, we have people living. There's roughly 30,000 people living there. Some on Santa Cruz, some on San Cristobal, some in Puerto Villamil, and some in Floriana. It's one of the world's largest marine reserves. And what is tourism like there? It's transformative and experiential. So what I'm talking about today is what it would be like on a Galapagos live aboard cruise. We do have something called island hopping, but I just want to give you a feel of what the experience would all be about. So we have, most boats would have two different itineraries because within 14 days, you can't go back to the same site. It's too, uh, lower the impact in the various sites, not having too many boats at one visitor site. It's not that we can go anywhere, it's determined by the national park. 
So that generally these little maps will tell you this is what we call the Western Islands. This is in our case, we call the Eastern Island itineraries. What makes Galapagos so unusual is, well, to begin with, the stunning landscapes. These are geologically very young islands. So therefore, still in a developing stage. So things, the, the views and the development of the, of the land, the topography changes so much from one, from lush in the highlands, which I don't show any here, but you know, uh, here on Santa Cruz, uh, there are forests up in the highlands and the, to this, the coastal plains. The wildlife, the wildlife is, is quite tame. Many uh, endemic species or species found nowhere else in the world. And this is what people come to see. So here you have a land iguana, you have um, the sea lions, we have various birds, and of course, the land tortoise, the Galapagos, where it got its name. These tortoises are the largest in the world. They're also the oldest, and they actually do move faster than you think. And they can go for a very long time without eating. This is why back in the day, centuries ago, uh, the population was depleted quite a bit because they were taken by the buccaneers onto their ships. It was a good source of food. And of course, the marine iguana. It's the only marine iguana in the world that feeds underwater. And you will see a lot of them. <laughs> the seabirds also, this little penguin is one of the smallest penguins, not the smallest, the albatross, this waved albatross, it only nests in Galapagos and on one particular island on hood at a certain time of the year. Of course, shorebirds are another option. And of course, the three species of boobies, the blue-footed booby, which is, you know, people love to to see, but we also have a red-footed booby and of course the Nazca booby. Land birds, the famous Darwin finch, finches, that what made Darwin was part of his um, studies for the theory of evolution. And so we have here flycatchers and the owl. And of course, the marine life, we cannot forget. Galapagos is, is, is one of those special places where it's not only the land life that, that is absolutely amazing, and that's why you come, but the water. We also have a very large marine reserve, one of the largest in the world. Recently, it was increased to 76,000 square miles. It's... Um, so when, you, when you're either snorkeling or diving, I mean, whether you see turtles, rays, sharks, sea lions, the playful sea lions, penguins. So a typical day on the boat, you will get to snorkel at least twice a day, but there are also dive cruises. And what is a daily experience like? They include dinghy rides, shore rides, sightseeing from the yacht, snorkeling, kayaking, land excursions, daily briefings, lectures. So a day on board a boat in Galapagos is quite busy. And of course, the naturalist guide. The naturalist guides can make it or not. So we pride ourselves in, in the standard of our guides because they're the people with you from dawn to dusk and will impart you with all the necessary information that you need for these islands. So that, in a nutshell, is what Galapagos is. So generally speaking, I would say about a week is spent there. And then we will get on a plane and we will fly back to Quito. Now, the three regions of mainland Ecuador. As I mentioned before, we have the ha Amazon, as they call it here, El Oriente, the east, the highlands, La Sierra, or the coast, La Costa. And one thing in all these regions in Ecuador that yeah. can make the country so very interesting are the people. We yeah. have 17 I'm, different I'm indigenous cultures and they do, they're quite distinctive from one area to the other. Even the Quechua they speak might be slightly different. Like the lady on the, on the screen with the hat, the black and white hat, she's from Saraguro. The other one with the Chimborazo in the background, she's from Salasaca. The gentleman in the middle is from the jungle. Uh, the other lady with all that beautiful embroidery is from Suleta. 
and the other one to the right, she's from um, the Chimborazo area. So, you know, it, it's what makes it unique as you travel. So even their markets could be slightly different. Their weavings are different. Interacting with the people is, is also a wonderful experience. And that's what we try to impart on most of our trips. So we'll start with the Anyan Highlands, which is culturally the most diverse and traditionally also throughout Ecuador. OK, what do we have here? We have two world heritage cities, Quito and Cuenca. We have the volcanoes that run through the highlands and they're the road, the Pan American Highway goes through there and it's called the Avenue of the Volcanoes because as you're traveling from Quito South all the way down to Cuenca from one side to the other, you will see a volcano as you go along. The colorful markets, hot springs, the national parks and reserves, historic haciendas turned into boutique hotels, community tourism options at in Otovalo, Quilotoy in various areas and adventure of course walking biking rafting trekking horseback riding mountain climbing anything to suit different people interests from soft adventure to to obviously more more strenuous and the cultural aspect of the churches the people the art galleries the food so what i've done here i've created like what what would a would an itinerary look like so I'm put together something here that's a mix of culture with nature's soft adventure every day. Okay, so we'll move along. So we'll start in Quito and we'll go north around here and come back. And it's what I like to call the northern loop and I will end in the hot springs. So you start in Quito, Quito which is close to 500 years old, is the highest constitutional capital in the world sitting at 9,350 feet above Sila, the first city to be declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And it's the second largest city in Ecuador after Guayaquil with a population of 2 million. It has, so what is the point? The, um, it's that rich historical aspect of the old city. So we always include a start, if possible, and a city tour in the old center to get an appreciation of the history of the country and also of the city. That's how we would start our trip. Here's one of the, the San Francisco. This is what the churches are like inside, but it's not only this, you will walk on the street, you can stop at a market, you can visit maybe a little chocolate factory there uh, to just get a feel of the city, the old city. And then from there, we'll head north towards Otovalo. So along the way, I mean, there's a tapestry of farms on the land. So we would stop and, you know, taste if there's interesting uh, food to taste along the way that happens. But we come into the famous Otovalo market, we wander around, we talk to people, we see what they're producing. It's some of these things, artifacts will come from various parts of Ecuador, but mostly what you see on the tables here, except for the painting, are all made around, Equ uh, around Otovalo. And so actually, this is why I was talking about some of the things you'll taste. These are the... Uh, famous cayambe bizcochos with a type of cheese. So we'll stop and have a, a little coffee break, trying something that's very typical to the region. And then we'll head on to visit uh, the weavers of the area. Uh, there are several that will have you visit their, their weaving shops and explain to you and demonstrate how things are done. And that you can appreciate then the work put into all these um, tapestries and various items that you will see in the market. And then from there, on that trip to the north, uh, we will also visit, depending obviously on people's interest, the San Clemente um, community. This gentleman and his wife, they run this, this, this little hostel here in conjunction with other members of the community. So several members of the community are part of this project. We overnight there, we share in their meals, we learn about their cosmovision, 
Um, they bring in singers and dancers that we can take part with. So there is a bit of sharing. We can spend from a day to a couple of days, depending on interests, help them with their farming or just, just be with them and learn for each other. And then from there, we'll go on to Kotakachi, which is a leather town. I, I didn't show any images of the leather, but you can buy anything leather there because the day I, I the last time I was there just happened to be a festival. There are over 150 festivals year round. So you can pop in on one stop, listen, enjoy here. Um, I'm not exactly sure what it is, but I mean, they're usually quite colorful. A lot of them are around religious holidays. Um, so that is a great one. And then from there, through the countryside, we'll probably stop at a small waterfall and have a little walk or a picnic outside. And then we're on to an hacienda. In that area, there's several haciendas. Here are some images of Suleta. Uh, many of these haciendas, they are actually, they were farms, farm homes turned into boutique hotels. Some of them are still working farms. This particular one still is. They even have a small cheese factory on site. Uh, they have horses, they have a condor breeding center. So they're, so not only can you uh, learn a lot, actually this one belonged to the president of Ecuador, Galo Plaza many years ago, it's still within the family. Uh, so, and each one has a history with it and a lot of the old furniture, the photographs. So it's a, uh, an experience of back in time. So once we leave the Otavala area, we'll then head towards the uh, cloud forest, the Papayakta hot springs. On the way, we could stop at an orchid center and appreciate hundreds of orchids there. Uh, otherwise, we'll go straight to the hot springs. And as you can see from just the images talk for themselves, these amazing hot springs and spa set within uh, the cloud forest area there. And as you can see in the background there, there is Antisana. Uh, so we'll spend a little bit of time there before either continuing back to Quito, people go home or they'll continue to the jungle. Otherwise, here's another option. We can do Quito, Guayaquil via Quantico. So now we won't do the north. We were just up here. We're just going to start here and head through the avenue, the volcanoes to Cuenca and down to Guayaquil. All right, there again, it's a great mixture of culture nature, soft adventure, it's haciendas, horseback, rose farm, the Inca ruins, the only ones in Ecuador. So deemed the avenue of the volcanoes for a reason. The Andean highlands have 32 volcanoes, both active and dormant. And it really is not only a thrill to the mountain climber, it is really a feast to the eyes. I mean, this is Cotopaxi, here is Kilotoa Lake. Oh, this gives you an image here. This is at the, um, the little museum at the Cotopaxi. Uh, so you can see here, you know, all the various um, volcanoes. All right, so what, what happens in this area? We started by going to an hacienda. We can do some horseback riding. We can do some trekking in the area, walking or even biking. Uh, so there are activities around there and overnighting at the hacienda. It could be the, the Porvenir Hacienda, the Cienega Hacienda, any one of those. So you overnight and you have these activities around the national parks. And also we can visit a rose farm. The ro Ecuadorian roses are considered the best in the world. And apparently this has to do with the location on the, the altitude, all year sun and being on the equator. So uh, this is really quite informative and quite the experience. Um, what is of interest in that area too, other than the markets where we'll talk about, because there's always a market, a different market in a different day of the week. Uh, there's a, a little town there where they're famous for their naive painting. So you can visit an artisan, learn where this come from, how it started. Uh, and yeah. Or just on any day, given day, as I said, there is a market. So there are certain ones, you know, on this day, it will happen. Like one here is Sakisili. Uh, 
because uh, it's the Otavala market is mainly an artisan market with with weavings and so on, but it is really a lot of fun to go into one of the local markets where uh, they're selling the produce that the people in the area are either coming to sell or to buy. And it's so colorful. I mean, remember Ecuador is, even though it's on the equator, it has a temperate climate and a tropical climate. So even though we'll have mangoes and bananas, but we'll have pears and apples and potatoes and, and things that belong to a temperate climate. Um, and it's not, you know, what we try to do is when we visit, you know, chit chat with the ladies or the men selling, buy some of their produce and learn a little bit. So other than the markets and the artisans in the region that will stop off, the views along are just stunning. I mean, there is Chimborazo, there is um, close to Sangai. Um, so, so we get out, we walk. Uh, we take photographs, we have a picnic, and sometimes even in the town of Salasaka, here we are visiting some friends there, having a meal with them, and in Salasaka they weave differently. So this gentleman here is weaving a poncho. Uh, the men there wear the, those ponchos. Oh, the other thing in that area, on the way to Cuenca, the train rides. Well, currently, the trains after the pandemic or when the pandemic started, all the trains in Ecuador ceased to operate. Uh, but I'm sure at some point this will come back. And once they do come back, uh, this is also quite, it's, uh, this is the famous Devil's Nose uh, train ride, as you can see the, the you know, it's gonna do this switchback and to get down here. But there, this train can also take you all the way from Quito with different stops all the way to Guayaquil, or there's a train ride in the north from Ibarra down to San Lorenzo. So that's another activity to be enjoyed. And the train currently, well, when we were doing the train ride, we would start in La Laosi, which is a colorful, picturesque little town in the mountains. And then from there, we'd hand on to Inga Pirca. It's considered one of the most pre-Columbian structures in Ecuador. Here you'll find the remains of two ancient culture, cultures, yeah, Cañaris and Incas, and their coexistence together. So this, you know, we'll spend a few hours here learning a bit about, you know, how long the Incas were there, what this was, and about the cultures before the Incas. And then from there, we'll go on to Cuenca. Cuenca is the third largest city in the country with a population of roughly 400,000 people, also a UNESCO World Heritage Site known for its ornate Spanish architecture, winding cobblestone streets, and a variety of artisans. And the, and the Panama hats um, that originated in Ecuador. So it's a lovely little place to stop over for a couple of days to visit. Um, well, of course, not only the, the churches and the places and, and take a lovely walk around the town, the flower market. It's really quite beautiful to watch is every kind of flower being sold there. And then the artisans. Around Cuenca, you have various little villages that specialize in different um, um, should I say, like here, this lady with the, the red hat, she's wearing an ikat poncho that the man is, is weaving. And here to the right, they're explaining this. These, um, this is very special to Ecuador, in fact, and just done in this region. Uh, they've been, uh, the, the designs have been carried down from generation to generation. And when I started in tourism in mainland Ecuador over 30 years ago, it was a dying art because the men were leaving the town and heading to the United States. So it's a wonderful thing, opportunity now to see it revived and kept alive and in a good part, thanks to tourism. So we come there, we, we learn from them how it's done, how the dyeing process is done, because they do everything. The women do the knots, the dyes and all that, and the men do the backstrap weaving. The other thing is the, this filigree work here in a little town called Chertelec. All they do, well, not all they do, but the main thing they do is this silver filigree so we can meet the people. 
not shown here are the another little village where they make these guitars with these inlays. So there's a little bit of everything that we can share and meet and learn from them. Sorry, there's this fly here. I'm in Galapagos. Okay, the iconic Panama hat is from Ecuador. And even though, as you can see from the right, these, um, these reeds, these, the, the lady and her son are carrying around, they're not grown in Cuenca. They're grown in another region of Ecuador. They're harvested, they're dried, and then they're brought to Cuenca, which is one of the cities where they make the hats. And you will see as you travel around the countryside, women weaving hats like these women. This was in Cuenca, just on the side of the road. And the hats are taken in either to the big factories or to smaller factories and they're sorted and then sold. So what we try to do is visit the smaller factories where you can talk to the women that are actually weaving and making them. And then it's always fun to go to the big factory where you know famous people in the world have bought their hats there. And understand what the difference is between a hat that costs $30 and a hat that costs $10,000. All right, so we finished with Cuenca, and now we're going to head towards the coast. Along the way, we will stop at the Cajas National Park to stretch our legs, which is a national park just outside of Cuenca. Now, what does the coast have? The coast is known for the whale watching, which is uh, the humpback whales come through there uh, between the months of June, I think it is, and September. Chocolate farms, bird watching, beaches, of course, Guayaquil and the cuisine of the coast. So on the way to Guayaquil, we stop at a little farm called Cacao and Mango to have the experience to learn about the cocoa process. It's this very small farm run by a family and they show us how they make their chocolate they we get to taste the raw cocoa we get to taste a, a drink and then we have a meal there with all the the produce from their farm because they also produce other things then in guayaquil well we don't generally spend too much time but guayaquil is sometimes overlooked but it's worth a walk around this las peñas the this bohemian artistic area the, this one park with all these iguanas or stay in um this old um hotel with this architecture from from you know a while ago which was very typical in on the coast which is very different to the north and then guayaquil is on this river uh, it's um, here is, you know, it's there's what they call the Malecon. You can take a nice stroll along there. So there, there's something to do in Guayaquil. Now, so that gives you an idea of what I've just covered is a trip from Quito to Cuenca overland with all the highlights to keep you very busy culturally and activity wise. The other thing is for those who would like bird watching, more natural history there is what we call the bird watching and rainforest loop. So you can fly from Quito all the way to Coca and do a river cruise, not a river cruise. You get to, you go to a lodge, uh, you go down the river to get to the lodge. You stay in the lodge for several days and do trips around in that area. And then you can come back over land all the way to Quito. And then you go to this other area, which is also um, Mindo, which is also cloud forest. So for bird watching, we cover from the high from the high Andes or the Paramo area all the way down to the cloud forest, or back again, or this way. So it's nature focused. It's for birds. It's for orchids, wildlife, walks, hot springs. That's the main focus on this one. Nasha, mainland Ecuador has 10 national parks and 25 reserves that range from its high volcanic lands, the Amazon basin and the coastal zone. The bird watching with over 1,600 bird species, mammals with wild orchids. So Ecuador is a nature lover's dream. Small, therefore less travel and bird more. From high Andes, the cloud forest to the jungle. I mean, the hummingbirds. 132 species. That's amazing. 
So here we are in the Amazon region. This is just one of the many lodges that are available. This is what it would look like. A lot of them have the, you know, high uh, towers or, um, I forget what you call them, but, you know, up in the treetops, you have these walkways, you can walk to get a different perspective of the jungle. So this is the wildlife, very different than Galapagos, obviously. And the experience is about the nature and the people. So you can visit a, a community there and learn about whole different experience of what what it is to to be uh, an indigenous community or to live in the highlands what it is in the jungle you taste the food you see you talk to them you learn a bit from them and of course the wildlife which is the main thing so in a nutshell endless activities there's in this tiny country that it's easy to travel. So you do spend less time getting from one area to the other. You can within a week get a really great perspective of the country, but also a variety of experiences, whether it's cultural or it's wildlife or it's activities. All of that can be uh, packed in a very small time, you know, whether it be uh, biking, rafting horseback riding. Uh, th there is really a lot to do. So often, if people overlook the mainland, they're really losing out on something very important. And very rich. The train rides, the mountaineering, the trekking, hiking, nature. Oh, I didn't mention the gastronomy. Uh, it's often overlooked in Ecuador. I mean, we don't think of Ecuador in terms of gastronomy, but because it's such a, a diverse country, the land is so different from the jungle to the highlands, to the coast, and the people vary a lot. So that has influenced um, the, the food, the dishes that are prepared in one region versus another, like the sea, the coast is heavily seafood with coconut. The highlands would be lots of corn and potatoes and meats and soups and, and different things. Uh, so this is something we encourage and we showcase on our tours. So if we're going to be in this area, we'll be eating this and let's try this. And this is associated with that. And, and so you get a feel for the country through the dishes and then uh, and better understanding of the people and what they're growing. So very flavorful. Yeah. So thank you for joining us. And I hope you this has helped you better understand Ecuador. And if you have any questions, do let me know. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Emerging Destinations. So much for that presentation, Judy. Um, I'm not sure if you're able to hear me. Judy's currently in the Galapagos. So I know that um, with that comes some um, internet issues. So bear with us here. We'll just see if we can get Judy um connected to the audio again um but please uh send send through any questions that you do have so if we can't get her connected to the audio uh we will make sure to answer all of those questions that you've typed through i know a few people have typed some through through during the presentation so we will definitely answer those um in the webinar follow-up if we if we can't get to them right now but um if you do need to step away also keep in mind that we this webinar will be recorded so if they're, um, I know we're at that 40 minute mark now. So um, if you do need to step away, no worries, we completely understand. So Judy, I'm not sure if you can hear me. We might just have to um, just do it the old fashioned way and type out, um, send the questions out to you written. But if you do have questions, please do type them through now. Um, we're more than happy to help you with those um do, do, do. so i know we have one question here about the devil knows so i'll have to i don't personally know when um when that train ride will commence but once we 
and Judy might have some um, a better idea of that. So we will definitely answer that for you. Just seeing what else has come through. So we had a question about how long do you need to do a Galapagos trip? So that that really depends. I mean, obviously the best amount of time uh, would be a week as Judy mentioned a week is ideal and the reason for that is because then you're on board the the ship and you can actually take the time to go out to those islands that are a bit further away that you you need more time just to to get to them so for that reason um a week is typically the recommended um length of time to spend in the Galapagos um how many passengers are on our ships so both both the Cachalote Explorer and the Beluga are 16 passengers each so um both of them um are 16 so just small which is very nice very intimate um i had the opportunity to go on a on a cruise last june um oh there we go i think we might almost have judy sorry judy you're just self-muted now so if you can unmute then we can maybe maybe get you in here to answer a couple questions so there we go judy okay yes we got you okay oh, oh my gosh this has been so frustrating <laughs> That's but, okay. i was keeping everyone distracted. <laughs> we're trying to um wow. so there was a couple questions yeah. that um i answered but uh here's a question for you judy what is the best time of the year to okay. visit the Galapagos? Okay, there is no best time because um, it, how should I put this? Um, here in Galapagos, it's seasonal all year. And the reason being because uh, the, the climate is temperate, it does change from the hot season to the cooler season. But the reason we run all year uh, is because, for example, we have the albatross, which are here between May and the end of December. So if people are really interested in seeing the albatross, they'll time their time then. If you do not like hot weather, then I wouldn't come March or April. Uh, so I wouldn't say there is a best time. It's as you will see as much, with the exception of the albatross, all year. Uh, the waters are cooler and the air is a little cooler and the water is a little rougher in what we call the Garua season, which would be from July to October. Um, it tends to be a low season in September. And traditionally that happened for whatever reason, maybe because kids are going back to school and it's now the time of the year where most of us will stop our boats and do refits. So there are less boats operating in September and the ocean is probably, I would say, a little rougher. So it, there is no best time unless you are and looking just, for the outcross. Okay, perfect. And there's another question that which kind of leads into what you were just answering, but it's um, how rough are the waters near the Galapagos? Oh, nothing like in, <laughs> I've been in the Caribbean where pretty, pretty rough. I've been in the Northwest of Canada in ocean there. That's really rough. No, it's not that rough here. Um, we will get, you know, it's a little, a little rougher, but it's not those huge seas. It's it, oh, nothing like that. Like from now, like January towards May, it tends to be quite calm. This is also why it's not really a sailing destination. I mean, there are a few boats and we did have one that have, had sails, but it's not really a sailing destination. Uh, you need to motor to get from one place to the other. We, when we originally, when we had our sailboat, we would cut the engine to do a little sail. It was more for the looks and for stabilizing, uh, but it's not, it's not huge waves and really rough seas. No, not at all. I mean, we travel at night and you may have one crossing, uh, say from when we go up to tower, it could be a bit, yeah, a little rough, but not where you're falling out of your bed and, you know, things are tumbling all over the place. No, it's not like that. 
Right. And we had we had a question come through, um, and I don't know if you'll be able to answer it or what information you have on the ground there. But do you know when the Devil Knows um, train ride will commence? Do you guys have any rumors in Ecuador? Uh, we just have somebody whose clients want to do it this year. They were asking. Uh, yeah, I doubt it would be ready this year. Uh, okay. Things are moving back slowly, but I don't think it's a product. That's why I left it in my presentation because it is a highlight. But I haven't heard any rumors. Uh, I'm sure they're looking for new operators to take over because it was government run. And then obviously with the pandemic, you know, for obvious reasons, they could no longer run it. Uh, but as soon as we know something, we would let everybody know. But I wouldn't build your hopes for this year. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I think that that answers that. Um, and then we'll just do one more question just because we are... Um, running a bit over today and I, I did answer this one briefly for everyone Judy but I do want to hear um, your answer which I'm sure will be better than mine um, how long do you need to do a Galapagos trip well ideally a week I mean it's a once in a lifetime generally it's an expensive and far destination and there is a tendency for people to say okay I'm gonna go there for four days four nights but you know what you do miss a lot I mean you have to remember there are 14 islands and you have to get from one to the other and it's not that they're all they all look the same and you're going to see exactly the same thing we do um like a, what do you call a five night and a seven night and we've had people on the cruise say can i stay on i would generally recommend a destination like this to spend a week if you're doing a live aboard to really get to see as far as possible and as much as possible and I can guarantee nobody will be bored. They'd be happier for it. Perfect, that's similar to what I said, so I'm doing all right. Um, for, okay, sorry, <laughs> we just got, we got one one last question in here and then we'll wrap it up. Um, I know I we didn't have the entire Q&A time with you, Judy, so that's why I'm letting, um, letting it go. Sorry a about bit that. Longer. Oh, no, no, that's fine. It's the Galapagos, yeah. I completely understand. So for the photography buff, which island route would you recommend? I would recommend both, um, either one. We've had, when we, often that time when we've had photographers, they've done both, you know, the two week. Uh, if you, okay, all right, you have a photographer and I would say then do the tower, the what we call the Eastern one, but come when the albatross are there then I would say, okay, if you have the choice of one, let's do the Eastern one. Okay, perfect. Um, and I know I said that was the last question, but then we got another one typed through and it just, it only feels right that we close off um, with this. Uh, so what about length of time for mainland Ecuador? So I know you just said you'd recommend a week in the Galapagos since you're there once in a lifetime experience. And if you're doing the combination between the two, how much time would you allot to do mainland Ecuador? If possible, a week, or at least five days. You know, it's it's such a shame to to sort of skim over, just stay a night and do a city tour. I mean, you've seen from the images, there's there's so much to see. At least get get out of the city, get to a market, get to the north, get to the south. Uh, if possible, the jungle. I mean, I know a lot of people really want to see the jungle. So for the jungle, you need at least three nights. Uh, we generally right. fly down. So if you had a combination. I know in the United States, the holidays tend to be shorter. So like two weeks, if you can do two weeks in Galapagos, I mean, a week in Galapagos and a week in the mainland, you really have the country pretty well covered. Our European clients tend to have longer holidays. So they they do see more and do more. But yeah. that's the ideal scenario, a week here and a week in the mainland. Perfect. Well, I, we're, let's wrap up there since I know we've gone, um, we've almost taken an hour of your time. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us and for asking us all those questions. We do as well have some um, specials that are valid right now. So I will make sure to include those in the webinar follow up. But if you have any other um, questions for me, you know how to reach me, Jen at EmergingDestinations.com. And if not, I will be sending this recording out to everybody in the next um, several days here. So thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Judy. We had so many comments about how great of a presentation that was. So really appreciate you taking the time, especially while you're in the Galapagos, to connect with us. 
Thank you so much, Jenna, and thank you everyone who's there. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.